So I first want to just say how impressed I am that this many people are still here at 4.05 on a Friday, because for those of you not from New York, typically people don't do conferences late on Friday because not many people stick around. So I think we're thrilled that you're here and hopefully we'll make it, we'll make it worth your while. I think we're going to do this panel just a little bit differently because we've heard so much that to give you any more detail and information and projects would be almost overwhelming. So I think what we'll do is ask each of the panelists here to introduce themselves, but also just give some comments and thoughts, picking up any of the themes we've talked about. And we've talked about a lot of things from public space to financing mechanisms, to governance and institutional questions. So I think if we just allow um, these guys who've thought about these issues a lot, to give you some thoughts, maybe you know five or seven minutes each, and then um, I have a couple questions, but really this is the chance for you guys to um, to ask some questions of um, some real thinkers about the waterfront. And I'll start with Alexis from Istanbul. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, does my microphone work? <coughs> no, no. Okay. Are all the mics on? Okay. Well, I'll just speak loud. Yep. Um, I'm Alexis Chanal. I'm from Istanbul. Um, I moved there. 14 years ago, which is a fairly transformative experience for myself. Um, I'm a practicing architect and urban designer with a small practice in Istanbul, and we have um, focused our entire practice on um, civic and civil architecture and urban environments. Um, and one of the things that we've really been focused on is how um, macro and micro economies can kind of um, create a synergy uh, that is creates kind of sustainable communities and sustainable life. Um, I present this image today about Istanbul because I think it captures a lot about my experience in the city and this idea of um, a concept that I wanted to present today and I heard talked about a lot today, which is this notion of speculation. Um, this is a drawing done in 1992 uh, by an artist, Devrim um, uh, Um And at the time, the city was very different. This is, uh, what would it be, 20 years ago? And there was a lot of speculation about the energy of the city, the way that private and public development was changing, and how the two continents were moving together, and how this desire to connect, but yet the movements of the water framing the kind of global dynamics that was presented earlier, um, actually keeps much of the city, um, city's vitality, city's vibrancy, and the city's ability to constantly reinvent itself. And I kept on hearing that today um, throughout a lot of these conversations. We talk about this idea of um, kind of, I would add, we talk about kind of port to people. And some of the other things that I, I felt that resonated a lot was this notion of purpose. Um, we heard a little bit about um, legacy um, and how these projects can actually, because of their scale of investment in terms of infrastructure, in terms of mobilizing communities, um, in terms of investment, in terms of their potential longevity, can have a purpose <coughs> greater than themselves. Um, and how cities that create purpose greater than themselves um, start creating this great sense of co-creation of not only the city themselves, but their internal knowledge capital and how this knowledge capital can be very much based on their past um, and very much about reframing how they position themselves in a very changing world. Um, and I think one of the things that really resonated with me in the last presentation was this kind of, this kind of texture behind the port that there was this very holistic and natural relationships that have always existed between the spatial design of the port and the, what was happening behind and all the small businesses and large businesses that would foster each other with this spatial relationship. I mean, it's no mistake that, you know, behind the port of Galata, which has been a port for a significant amount of time, were, you know, the large steel traders and then next to it the smaller traders, and then the small machine shops that would support the repair and the trading <coughs> of goods, and then the small, um, slowly into consultancy offices, and now reinventing itself. So this, this idea of um, synergies and reinventing themselves, and I think also that this is a very organic and agile process. I think um, really resonated with me today as well, that um, although city planning has often tried to kind of um, plan for the future, um, typically, you know, um, 
life prevails. So although plans help us to kind of define problems and debate things, over time with a lot of different engagements, whether that's social participation or financial <coughs> markets changing or knowledge capitals with sin cities changing or you know, um, geopolitical dynamics around it changing, the role of um, the plan significantly reinvents itself over those periods of time. And I think what I'd like to add to this kind of port people purpose is some other things I thought came up today a bit that we, we overlooked, which is also, um, you know, how, how digital culture, which the, the film that Selva wanted to show really captures, is how digital culture and digital society is also changing these things, so how ports can become portals in a way, um, and how this can leverage new economies, and how these new economies can kind of offer both a kind of finer grain of um, economic entrepreneurship and venture capital. Um, but I'd also add this idea that I think is really important that I think New York has really pioneered, which is the role of transformative projects to engender popular culture that we're excited about. So if popular culture is about shopping and luxury, then that is where the marketplace is going to go. But if popular <coughs> culture is about being in public life and having access to um, social communities and the comfort by which we can live in a, a high level of diverse societies and feel secure and comfortable, then those communities of more popular ideas of culture um, will attract, you know, the, the most interesting, bright people in the world. Um, and, and this idea of quality of life, I think, is absolutely fundamental as the kind of value propositions um, <laughs> And vision making. And I think the last thing I'd really like to highlight, which we hear a lot about public participation, but I would actually say um, I, I think that's an important part of it. And I think, you know, it's been highlighted New York has been quite unique in all the cases with the mobilization of um, public interest, which is um, the sense of inclusion and how to create a shared future of these things. So if venture capital is only going to big business or if venture capital is only going to real estate development, it's kind of losing fact that that same capital can be going to engendering small businesses and new ideas and new relationships and, and that those things are that, what do you, the, the, the finer texture behind these ports that fuel them and, and sustain them. So I, I think those are the topics that really resonated with me today. Um, the, I guess the last one that I would say resonated with me in Istanbul that came up today. We talk about climate, climate change, um, but I would actually just highlight climate as a, a kind of function. Um, <coughs> you know, I think New York has this, that, you know, being on the waterfront in the middle of winter in Istanbul is a very miserable human experience. You're kind of blown away by the wind and, you know, um, and I think we have to recognize that, you know, creature comforts and how we design these spaces to comfort people and mitigate some of these things, or when you feel very exposed in summertime. So I think one of the things that I think is really important to regional design or port design or waterfront design is also this, this really important, um, you know, humanity's relationship to nature and, and the climate and the, the advocacy for the natural species to really... Um, that do create a lot of the, the nostalgia and memory. The blooming of the trees is, is a fundamental part of the beauty of a city like Istanbul. I mean, it's just the colors are off the map beautiful. And the desire for the city to access this beauty is incredible. Um, the delight of it, I mean, it's just... And so these deep memories that are universal in all people, I think are really important to that because, um, so I think in climate change, I'd also just talk about the fundamentals of seasons and what, you know, why things open in May and why, and that's very different in Rio and it's very different, I'm sure, in Mumbai because the climate is a bit more moderate. So the idea of public life is a bit different because it's not based on seasonal change. Um, so. That's great, thank you. thank you. And now we're off to Mumbai. Um, but um, but not really because we are um, we're going to turn this over to Raul to comment on the general themes. Thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, you know I, I'm an architect. I I practice in Mumbai, 
Uh, I also teach at the GSD in, uh, at, at Harvard. Uh, and I think starting 96 or so, uh, P.K. Das, Pankaj Joshi, many of us uh, here in the room actually have been involved in projects which have to do with the public realm, recycling land, urban conservation, but a whole gamut of issues that really concern this sort of uh, um, idea of public engagement, uh, uh, public institutions in planning, uh, and a whole gamut of issues around that. And so the work on the eastern waterfront and on the western waterfront, uh, these are projects that I think we have com common or shared histories that go back to, well, 14 or 16 years now. So it's really interesting to listen to that presented now in the context uh, of other cities, and that's been, that's been wonderful. I couldn't help thinking through this, uh, through today, that we are like lemmings. Uh, we uh, first are all gravitating towards coastal cities. All our mega cities are growing like crazy on the coast. Now within cities, we are pushing towards waterfronts and wanting to open them up as the oceans rise. And lemmings tend to do that. So is that a kind of destructive mode uh, or is it um, uh, contingent on just densities? I'm not sure. But that sort of triggered off in my mind at least uh, what was interesting for me to keep mapping through uh, the day was some of the kind of contradictions that were emerging. And I, I mean, I found that comment uh, on the last panel by the gentleman there really insightful where he said this, well, what I read as a systemic problem in the structure of the conference where we had like-minded people on every panel. So the rough panel sounded like the bad guys. <laughs> Gita's panel sounded like the good guys. And if you actually mixed it up, you might have had a different kind of conversation. And I think it's, it's, you know, it's really important. I think that was really a fantastic insight because it also points to the kinds of contradictions that exist and what are the fora by which we can begin to reconcile them, uh, you know, talk across these differences to make something happen. And so I'm just going to, I think, just share with you some thoughts that went through my mind uh, as I was listening. So I think the first thing that sort of struck me, uh, and I know this from Mumbai, is the question of capacity data. So there's a kind of contradiction sometimes or a mismatch between our own aspirations in these conditions, and it varies. I'm, I'm sure in New York you don't face the same problem with capacity and data as we do in a place like Mumbai, which itself is integral to a kind of uh, democratic engagement, and that's part of the problem. So this was one, I, I don't know how we reconcile. The other was, I think, just a scalar question that I, I saw as a, a gap that we need to fill somehow in the narratives that we construct about our discussions, which is the kind of micro, and you, you refer to it as in terms of economy, but also in, a, in, in scalar terms vis-a-vis uh, -vis our imagination of, of spaces within the city, but also the regional imagination of how this is situated within the region, because the dynamics of the region uh, are also bear on this. And I know for a fact, like the Eastern Waterfront, you can't discuss it without contextualizing it in the metropolitan region, et cetera. Not only because perceptually it cuts off what is New Bombay and the region, just in terms of people's imagination, but in terms of the economy, the synergies uh, that it can create in furthering that imagination is critical. So that discussion can't be detached. It has to kind of, you have to sort of slip between those two scales really uh, to clarify uh, some of the questions that we were sort of grappling. The other one that surfaced for me, which for me was very interesting, and I kind of attribute the idea to a colleague, Eve Blau, who works in uh, East Europe, someone Sibel also interacts with, uh, you know, and she describes what's happening in East Europe, uh, many parts of South America, Latin America, India especially, and so that's why our discussions resonate mm -hmm. around this issue, which is this notion of simultaneous transitions, mm -hmm. where when, for example, in India, mm -hmm. we are transitioning out of socialism into kind of embracing a capitalist free market economy, but these transitions don't happen overnight, and often planners, uh, developers begin to imagine it in those terms, but these are difficult transitions that often take many decades, and you're often transitioning out of one into the other simultaneously. And so the kinds of contradictions, I mean, the kinds of things that P.K. Das, for example, was putting on the table about movements, uh, and on the other hand, you know, Surrender was here concerned about, about free markets and how they operate in the case of Istanbul. These are inherent contradictions because these are imaginations that come out of two very clearly founded uh, political positions, uh, but 
I think the interesting thing is that they are in operation simultaneously. It's not one or the other. And this makes it very complex in ways we have to negotiate these terrains. And I think in all the presentations, this is something for me that kind of resonated very deeply as a contradiction that one we need to frame collectively in order to kind of intervene uh, in this space uh, more effectively, so to speak. The other question was, and this again I think ran through all the, uh, the, 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 the cities and the discussions, which is temporality or the temporal scale. Uh, because we, I think everywhere it emerged that these are struggles that have been going on for two decades, three decades, four decades. How do we learn from them? But our narratives are not yet sort of moved into a position where we can imagine or st strategize over a temporal scale. Uh, we are grappling with the temporal scale and you know, I was speaking to Tom Fox and he was saying, well, we have to think of our grandchildren and leave it to them. And I think that's fine, but we can also be strategic about it in terms of scenarios we build, uh, etc. I mean, of course the world and life is unpredictable, uh, but at least we, we need to somehow develop the, these narratives on a temporal scale. And I think it also would address the question of these simultaneous transitions as we can play out scenarios in ways those shifts can occur. And I think this is a big gap uh, in, in, in our discussion, as at least I see it. And the last one, uh, you know, well, I have two other points which I'll quickly touch upon. Uh, one is just the idea of best practices, and you know, that keeps coming up. Uh, and I think we have to interrogate this a little more sharply because, I mean, I'm very cynical about best practices. I think at best they're inspirational uh, because localized cultures, politics, you know, I mean, there's a whole landscape out there which is so specific. So how we use best practices, uh, we would I think over the coffee break talking about how there's a whole industry around discussions about cities uh, and uh, you know there's a lot being invested in it and best practices is one of those sort of uh, fuels that drive this whole sort of process and it's kind of problematic at one level and I think it needs discussion. I, I, I mean this is an intuitive sense about the problem that I have. And the last thing which again came up and uh, I think it's an interesting contradiction um, and I think Sibel talk, kept saying you know, the landscapes of production versus consumption, uh, and I think she's completely right. Uh, it seems like a lot of, I mean, a lot of the discussion really boils down to very monocultural scenarios with recreation. It often is images of people jogging or biking or taking their dogs for a walk. Eventually, waterfronts. Yeah, so it's, I mean, waterfronts seem to hinge on that scenario that everyone goes for a walk in the evening and has a, a lot of time to do that and people picnic. And, you know, it's like when we used to do hand drawn renderings that you had people holding balloons and, you know, it's kind of an equivalent of that. And so I think that is something. Something again to discuss, and so when we talk about production, what does it mean? There's a whole discussion out there, and I would push it at least for the Indian context and just to loop back to our history and tradition. You know, in the Indian context, waterfronts were always always religious spaces. Uh, you know, with industrialization, they became dumps. Uh, uh, the eastern waterfront is on the east. The rising sun is sacred. Uh, we never even, that's the big elephant in the room. We never talk about these as spaces uh, that might uh, fulfill other cultural requirements that we again don't really have a language of or we don't feel confident within political, particular political landscapes to interrogate these issues. Uh, and so these are, I mean, I think these are the questions for the future, so to speak, but in a sense, I'd like to pose them as a set of contradictions that exist uh, in a discussion like this. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. Next, I'll turn it over to um, Richard Plans, who many of you will know, um, heads up the urban design program here at GSAP. Yeah, okay. Um, I get two slides, right? <laughs> yes. So you have to study this carefully, and it's very small, I see. Uh, but uh, I couldn't be here this morning, so I, I wrote something last night in anticipation of what I thought would be discussed. <laughs> Actually, what I thought would not be discussed, so I, I'm not sure how I did. Uh, Mark Wigley said, is he still here? He said, uh, this morning was a contest between which city had the biggest problems. <laughs> and uh, to which I, I uh, responded, well, New York City definitely has the biggest problems. And David Letterman even said that 8th Avenue had the biggest potholes. 
uh, potholes so large that each one could have its own Starbucks. So there's no, there's no competition. But anyway, um, I think clearly the four cities are at different stages in this process. Um, and the, the, the comparisons are very important. Uh, so I would say I know more or less something about some of the cities. For Istanbul, for example, which I used to go to quite a bit, uh, you know, it's an amazing city, but uh, it's shifting radically and forcibly from the water in spite of the parks and this stuff. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I remember when that first bridge went in, how upset it made me because you could sort of understand the, the trajectory in terms of water as really a piece of, of functioning infrastructure. Um, and I think there's still some of that there, but clearly there's a, a big issue. I think probably we had the same profound questions back, you know, at the turn of the century when we started building the bridges. Because uh, you look at those old maps, you see something very different. From Mumbai, you know, we were there two or three years ago. We did a studio on the eastern waterfront. Um, removal of port seems all but inevitable. And I say, maybe not. Um, that's probably still a huge question, not entirely too late. But then what kind of port would it be? You know, these are big questions. They're changing concepts of ports everywhere. Um, ports, feeder ports, minor feeder ports, uh, et cetera. Um, and Rio, I guess, is already happening in part. Uh, one of our students has been working on that site, ex-students long ago, uh, Doika. Uh, but in any way, in New York City, I think all of this has already transpired. Um, so if we've made problems, yes, we probably have more problems uh, relative to the concept of where the waterfront would go. And I think uh, literally, if not figuratively, we've moved into what this adds, de depicts as the greenest backyard phase. Um, without a clear, a clear trajectory beyond this, um, on, the, on the left you see the same site, in reality on the right you see a fantasy of advertisement for one of the new condos. Uh, so within that view, you know, we see 1830, we see a place where 1830 was the Albany Pier. That was the waterborne spine of the Empire State, and New York City was a city, part of a city state. By 1850, becomes the culmination of the New York Central Railroad, uh, and this evolves into the High Line infrastructure in the 30s and beyond. Uh, which, of course, itself was unprecedented in, in this kind of scale and scope of, of, a, of, a, of a transportation um, infrastructure. In the 50s was Radio Row, which probably I remember. I don't know who else does. You know, this was really uh, the, the, um, the front office for our pioneering electronics industries. Morantz, Fisher, they were all in Long Island City. I mean, amazing, amazing technological um, advances at that time. Uh, so this culminates, of course, in the World Trade Center in the 60s, uh, and then its excavation becomes Battery Park City. So, you know, looking at that one view, just a simple Google Earth view, uh, there's an amazing set of layers which are all equally probably revolutionary in their, their impact. Uh, so the question is, what's the, what is now the trajectory? Of course, our agility in managing these, these um, reinventions is impressive. Um, but it's a story that can be told, I think, in several ways. And I don't know how, much, how, many, how many tales we can tell in one, one brief session here. But certainly, uh, we have to understand, I think, universally, that replacing infrastructure is not to be taken lightly. Uh, and uh, that's certainly true for, for New York City. Um, Manhattan lost its last rail freight yard to condominiums in the 80s. Um, no small consideration, probably 50 years from now. Uh, as late as 2000, this is Bloomberg period, 2002 to 2010, 64,000 blue-collar 
uh, jobs still disappeared. It's amazing they were still there, but they're gone. Um, and uh, for the last 80 years, of course, this has been orchestrated by government and private interests uh, with a regional plan which originates at that moment. So while this is impressive at one level, I don't think it can be seen as euphoric uh, at all. Uh, culturally, you know, and I suppose I'm representing whatever it was called, the street view or whatever, <laughs> um, as, as a kind of a hopeless New Yorker, but anyway. I think it is still Central Park, uh, which is apart from the political economy of the city, which is the civic space. Um, and what does that mean about the water? I mean, it's a very, very interesting design issue. Um, I don't see the water as being that important as having a condo with a view and a piece of grass and a jogging track but obviously I'm not a great jogger or anything like that, <laughs> as you can probably imagine. Uh, but that is the new normative waterfront uh, model, and not much else. So we have, we have a lot of work to do in the next several decades as this resource gets sort of chewed up and re re remade, uh, which has to do with basically with questions of, I think, of vision. Uh, then, Next, yeah. Very briefly, the climate change thing. I figured somebody would bring that up. I guess they did, right, this morning? Came, yeah. Came up. Big deal or just minor? <laughs> no, the, it, for another conference. <laughs> oh, another conference. Oh, it, was okay. just it was mentioned. mentioned. Okay, well, I'm going to do more than mention it because it's huge. Uh, I can't imagine a water port to whatever people conference without that reality being injected. So I'll, I'll just finish with that injection. On the left side, left, yes. Uh, well, let's say, I think all these cities are in a defining moment. That This question of ecology is what we share, uh, of course, in, in very different ways. The issue has been on the table since the 50s. I mean, if you go back into you know, the amazing group around the Club of Rome, for example, there are no surprises whatsoever. Um, but the, the, I think the, for our cities, the markets have had their way, um, and probably no more so than in New York, um, although it's an interesting amalgam of, of interests. Um, I think Sandy probably did inaugurate a sea change in thinking. Um, and on the left, you see the study from 2008 by some colleagues in the School of Engineering in which uh, the, the subway flooding was very precisely modeled, very accurately, uh, as, it, as, it out, uh, as it played out in, in Sandy. Um, so no surprises there. At the same time, of course, the, the Lower Manhattan Terminal is being reconstructed, uh, $530 million. Uh, now $530 million without <laughs> much benefit, including a closed terminal, and, and no, no, no real prospects for it opening, certainly within the next few years. So these are big, big issues. Um, and I think they have to be part and parcel of any kind of planning schemes. Uh, as far as how to handle this, you know, it's a, these are design issues. Um, I often think, well, the people with the condo and the patch of grass and the, and the water view should really go to Venice or, I don't know, Bruges to see an, other models of how this whole question is resolved uh, from a design point of view. Um, anyway, uh, Sandy, yes. Um, there's some action. The question is, is it enough? I think not. Um, and we could talk about that in some detail, of course. For sure, in the boardrooms of the real estate industry, uh, there is continuing concern. There will be. Uh, there has to be about financial um, viability of the, the kind of black green, green backyard strategy. Um, some will find a silver lining. I was interested to see in uh, Crane's New York business uh, three or four, maybe five months after Sandy, um, there was a kind of flurry of reportage implying uh, financial opportunity, and there was, you know. And then you think back to, okay, Chicago burned, London burned, you know, 
and th there is something about reinvention there, but we have to reinvent. Um, these are long-term questions, uh, but to be addressed now. Um, and then there's the problem of the chambers of City Hall and uh, short-term electoral cycles and, you know, what's next there. So I think I'll just leave it at this. I think these meetings are great. Cities have more to say to each other than the nations. <laughs> and this is a perfect example of how that can go. So That's great. Thank you. Thanks very much. And our... And Sean, I'll ask you to make some. Sean's also in the faculty here at GSAP. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Um, well, I've had the good fortune that not only uh, some of my research at, at Columbia and the real estate program has taken me to Rio, but also that uh, some of my work in, in private real estate investment has also enabled me to see some of the things going on in Rio. And I first um, became uh, interested in Puerto Maravilla and in the waterfront. Uh, revitalizations in, in Rio in the fall of 2010. I, 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 uh, I studied Puerto Maravilla for my master's thesis um, here in the real estate program and since then it's been very interesting to watch the progress of how that whole thing has unfolded and I, and I have to say that in many ways it's I guess exceeded my expectations in terms of some of the positive aspects. Um, today some of the things that were particularly resonant for me um, is that while these waterfront cities come with very complex challenges. At the same time, though, they hold what I believe to be tremendous potential. Um, and I can, I can really say with, with a lot of conviction today that from what I've seen, I think that the future of these waterfront areas um, looks very promising. Um, some of the challenges, um, and, and this is not exclusive to just waterfronts, by the way, but in a lot of cities that are growing and, and going through a lot of these um, issues, um, there's a lot of challenges with things like uh, gentrification, uh, affordable housing, social inclusion. Uh, John Alshuler made a really interesting comment today of how vital it is to have a really engaged public and to have the society at large and the, and the, and the, the constituency you know, plugged into what's going on, and I, I can't agree with that more. Um, the, Issues of public open space and environmental concerns, the issues of quality infrastructure and mobility, these are all, I think, things that are common to all the cities that presented today. But I also think we're seeing a positive trend here in that uh, I know that I've, I've seen a number of cases of this today where we're seeing um, cities encouraging um, many modes of transportation other than just automobile transportation. In this image here um, on the, the lower left-hand corner, you know, this, this depicts um, a number of, of modes of transportation for Rio, and the blue is the light rail, but you also have this orange kind of in the middle, which is the teleferico or kind of the gondola transportation that's going in. And then you have the subway, which already exists, and then you have, obviously, um, you know, some of the other uh, things there, such as their uh, uh, commuter rail, which all kind of, uh, the terminus of it is right really in the middle of the uh, Port of Maravilla area. So there was a theme today, I think, of, you know, everyone, you know, talking about encouraging, you know, transportation, um, getting away from uh, so much dependence on automobile, and I think that's really good. Um, one of the things that I've learned from Rio and from what's happening in Rio in these last couple of years is that it is possible to tackle very large-scale challenges in a really short period of time. If you look at what Rio has taken on and if you look at the progress that they're making in, in not very many years, it's, it's pretty remarkable and so that it's possible to do that. I know that all cities today are at various different degrees of uh, where they are in their development and where they are in, 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 in a lot of issues, but it, it, it gives hope to me that things like this can be done. And without straining um, municipal budgets, that there are ways that can, that can be done creatively. Um, to me, one of the most significant things about Rio is that in a city that is extremely geographically constrained, Puerto Maravilla will open up 5 million square meters of developable land right next, right next to the existing downtown. You know, and it was there all along, and now we're just finally um, utilizing it and, and taking advantage of it. Um, I also I think it's important to note that not all benefits can be measured in pure economic terms. There are benefits that are social, cultural, and environmental. Um, and any time you have, and I think this goes for any of these cities, any time you have visible progress, I think it has the effect of uh, building optimism and generating momentum. Um, to me, a very positive trend uh, going forward in a lot of these cities is that they are encouraging density in these downtown waterfront areas. And in many areas, these are areas that are very well connected to mass transit. 
Um, you, you've heard this before today, but you know, in the second half of the 20th century, a lot of these cities turned their backs on the waterfront, and you had, um, you know, you had a flight of residents from the downtown waterfront areas, and people abandoning residents abandoning the downtown areas. Verena made a great example of this with Nita Roy talking about the percentage of uh, the decline in population versus the, you know, the city overall and the uh, concentration of employment. You know, and Greg also touched on this: is that, um, you know, in, in in a city like Rio, you have. Um, a concentration of 65% of the commercial office employment in the downtown, but it's a downtown in which almost nobody lives. But I think in the future, and, and I think in, in the different cities you're going to see this in, to varying degrees in the near term or maybe a little bit in the longer term, but you are eventually going to see people, especially younger people, wanting to move back into the downtown areas. They want to be closer to work and they want to be closer to cultural amenities. Um, and this is actually in keeping with Rio's um, overall goal, which I know, I know Washington, you know, you'll, you'll hear him talk about this a lot, is that Rio has this goal that they want to increase the residential population of Puerto Maravilla by 80,000 people um, in the next few years. And so you're seeing this wonderful goal of um, increasing residential density in these downtown waterfront areas. Um, for many years, uh, you know, Rio was typically the, the uh, besides you know being the previous um, federal government headquarters. Um, even in, in more recent years, Rio was the headquarters for Petrobras and other petroleum companies, mining companies, some banks, insurance companies. But I think sometime in the 20th century, Sao Paulo really surpassed Rio as the center for corporate offices, especially multinationals, and especially Fortune 500 companies. But I think going forward, and Greg and I were talking about this last night, I think that in, in, in the not too distant future, you're going to see uh, a trend where companies are going to want to locate near these waterfront areas. They're gonna, uh, the waterfront areas are going to be seen as desirable place for companies to locate their offices. And I think you'll see this in some degree with the other cities as well. And you're going to see a trend towards um, companies wanting to locate in areas where people want to live and in areas where there's a great quality of life. Okay. Um, Rio has two tremendous assets. Um, one of them is obviously the rediscovering of the waterfront itself as an asset. But then there's this also um, this tremendous um, uh, historical heritage. And so the image there on the lower right-hand corner is, um, is, is, is a 19th century palace that Rio repurposed um, as a museum of art. So they're, they're seeing these assets um, as having tremendous potential to be capitalized on. And um, there's also cultural aspects such as the fact that in, in, the, in the port area, and this is shared by many other cities, is that you have uh, Pedro de Sal, which was historically the birthplace of samba music. And so this is a trend which I'm seeing a lot of these cities. You're going to have, just to finish up, you're going to see um, this increased vibrancy in residential, commercial, uh, and recreational uses is going to have the effect that it's going to greatly enhance the quality of life of the, of the citizens of these cities, and I think it will have a spillover effect in the areas immediately adjacent to the waterfront areas. And finally, um, as this image here um, on, on the upper right shows, when people disembark cruise ships in Rio, many of them foreigners, Puerto Maravilla is the first part of the city that they experience close up. And so beyond improving the quality of life for the citizens of Rio, and, and as well as these other cities, the waterfront will play a tremendous role in enhancing the image of these cities as seen by the world. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sean. Um, okay, so we're going to open it up to questions in a minute, but um, I'm going to take uh, conference organizers' prerogative to just make three really quick points. Um, and they're points, really, that, that I drew from today's discussions. In part, I'm making them because I'm trained as a political scientist, not as an architect or an urban designer. And so they may be obvious um, to, to, to some of you, but to some of you, they may, they may not. For those of you who see the pretty pictures of Brooklyn Bridge Park and everything else New York has done, I made the point um, when, when John Alshuler was here that none of these developments came easy. Each of them came after previous plans for a previous development that basically imploded once they were taken out to the community. So that sort of community engagement, that sort of groundswell happened. It didn't happen as part of the initial planning process. It happened in reaction to some plan that was put together by it doesn't even matter who. And that tends to be the rhythm for big development projects in this city, whether they're waterfront or whether they're the Coliseum and Time Warner. You need to have almost a straw man that gets taken down by the public to understand what the public really wants. You almost have to bounce off the curb 
to drive in a, in a straight line here. So all of these projects were the product of many, many plans and many, many activists, and they are the better for it. But don't think for a moment they came easy. Um, one other political science point um, that, that John Alshuler and I have both been involved in for decades, which is none of these projects happen through the normal channels of government. They could not have been done by the city, they could not have been done by the state, and they're certainly not in this country done by the federal government, because the federal government, other than passing through money, um, is not really involved at a local scale. Thank goodness, because can you imagine three levels of government? But I will say that they, they cannot be done by one. So this idea of special purpose corporations that are set up, typically by the city with the state to make something happen is really the only way that we've been able to do waterfront development. That doesn't mean that any special purpose corporation could do it. We talk about the Port Authority as a bi-state entity, its regional powers. It has never been able to do waterfront development with the exception of the World Trade Center, which it was asked to do so it would take over the loss-making railroad that connected New York and New Jersey. So these are really very, Brooklyn Bridge Park was a very specific creation of city and state, as was Hudson River Park, because you need both entities to come together for a variety of reasons, which it's too late in the day to go into. So thinking about that and, and that idea of what kind of governance, what kind of institutional structure, which could be temporary, it could be something that sunsets once the development and is, is done, is something that probably is worth thinking about in other places, although it would take other forms. And the last piece I, I just wanted to say, having spent my career um, in sort of public and private sectors and as well as academia, is that in no, no circumstance that I know of has government not provided financial support for the infrastructure needed to make any of these projects happen. And you look at Rio, and that is not total private sector money. That support for that CPAC funding mechanism is very squarely government-based. The reason the city supports it, it's government-based. The London Olympics, another big project, happened with an awful lot of government infrastructure and support. So to think that everything can be privatized and we will end up with the right solution, there isn't enough money in the private sector and the type of development we all, as societies, want to see on our treasured waterfronts to make that happen. So I'm going to end there and open it up to questions. And I would ask that because we're, we're you know, late in the day, that if you could address your questions to a specific panelist, that would probably be the easiest so we don't take four answers on everything. Questions? Sure. You know what? There's a mic, if you could. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering what could be done in the design community to address better maritime infrastructure at the water's edge uh, and perhaps across various cities, I'm not directing this, I'm sorry to anyone, what's been done to include better access for boating in those cities and how could that inform better access for boating in New York City? In particular, an example is the very local West Harlem Piers here, which won an award for the landscape design and is um, the pier structure itself is really unusable by boats in many ways. So what are your experiences along those lines and what could be done to improve that for public space? Well, I, I don't know if anybody wants to, to, to answer that because I'm, I'm probably the only one that really has a maritime or ferry background and really what I know best about is, is New York. And, and, and London, which is not, not here at the table. Um, and I can only say that it is, it, you know, there have been some um, gestures on the waterfront in New York that have maybe been more gestures than they have been functional in the West Harlem Pier. Um, it's funny that you say it because I went out there earlier this week to try to figure out how to land a boat there. And it's almost impossible to land a side loader ferry there because they only built it for front loading ferries. And the ferries <laughs> that want to land there actually load on the side. So. Go figure. So, you know, these, these mistakes do get made. Um, I don't, you know, I certainly know that in a city like Istanbul, ferries are, are, have been historically the lifeblood of the city. So I think they, they have found various ways to accommodate both large and small. But maybe Alexis wants to. I mean, I, I speak very naively about it. I know in Istanbul, there's a, actually the, the second pro project that was shown for privatization that has a big marina component in the Holich area, which has been quite controversial because it allows for another type of exclusive community to take over the waterfront. I know that they have um, 
through this idea of organizational, um, organizing the transport, a group that slowly took over um, the management of cars and parking has slowly also taken over the management of docking um, and slowly has provided marinas up the coast. Um, and at the same time, I don't know about New York and Mumbai, but it's an international water, so sailing is actually prohibited. It's allowed on the marina, uh, Shea Marmara Sea. So I think some of the greater dynamics of the city movement, as far as the ferries go, I think um, there is an interest as the, at least the Hollich develops and has the type of residential, like residential community living there. There will be plans for a lot more very localized sea transit or ferries to go back and forth and kind of knit that community together. But um, again, I speak in very naive, like, I mean, in Mumbai, nothing's happened, so, but I just want to take the question in another way, uh, which is, I think, what I understood from your question, and I allude back to what Sibel was sort of posing as consumption and production, and actually what I really meant when I even brought up the question of religion was not religion per se, but the, the idea of purpose beyond just recreation. Uh, and so, I mean, I think, if, for example, in Mumbai, there's a very active fishing community, which is not an organized industry, but it's a much finer grain fishing industry. Now, that could very well be integrated in these imaginations, for example, and therefore, there'd be certain kinds of infrastructure that would follow. But, I mean, I think your question points to this idea that the, the discussion has to be nuanced with uh, the, the idea of what is the purpose of these waterfronts beyond just becoming places of consumption, and I would extend recreation as a form of consumption in the way it's represented, which is what I was reacting to. Yeah, Actually, I, I agree right. totally. I mean, there's no, I think it's a, a cultural issue fundamentally. We, we don't know what to do with water post industrial yeah, that's and, right, exactly. in our cities, yeah. and, and so, I mean, everybody has miles of this stuff, uh, which is <laughs> how much more can we have of it? You know, I mean, it's but anyway. Yeah, but I, I totally agree. Yeah. But I don't know how Sao Paulo is. I actually think I'd also add to that this idea if you bring in big, large kind of landscape ideas, at least in Istanbul, the, the watershed is actually a much more interesting question. Um, and I think we did see one slide on the relationship of the watershed to the water. And um, I think when you look at this notion of the like cultural relationship to the water, um, and its marine life and its marine culture and as economies to that marine and how new economies are you know, having sailings or ferries. I think it's a really important question to get away from the shoreline and also think about that greater um, system because I think I know at least one marina was stopped because of how polluting, in fact, marine vehicles are. Um, and how damaging it is to these more fragile waterways that don't have a lot of regeneration and cleaning systems because they're, they're either dead ends or um, other things. So I think, mm -hmm. from a landscape point of view, I think it's a very powerful question to look at that regional water system, too. Mm -hmm. But we need to build with water. That's right. That's the basic yeah. question. I mean, look at the... Sorry. the oh, sorry. No, I'm carrying on. But no, the big thing about the High Line, the accident on the High Line, is that now you have a park going through buildings. You know, which is, I mean, what is the equivalent of that for water edge in a dense city, in Manhattan, for example? I mean, but anyway, that's... VK, did you have some questions? I just thought there's um, maybe, maybe one key aspect of waterfronts, which probably we didn't uh, bring up adequately, is the issue of water itself and dealing with water and the kind of uh, condition the water is in most cities at its edges. Uh, extreme cases of Mumbai where we let our sewerage directly into the coastlines. And so with the waterfronts, I think we need to equally address the issue of water. And it's an extremely important point from the ecological point of view and, and, and natural regeneration, uh, which is becoming increasingly a way of thinking of protection of our coastlines. For example, regenerating nature, in which case water and regeneration of nature probably would have to be a, a serious aspect of yeah, the discussions around waterfronts. Mm -hmm.
Sure. Yeah. No, just to extend that, these two last comments, I was just thinking about Mumbai, for those of you who might know it. You know, there's a wonderful temple tank called Banganga, mm -hmm. which is fresh water that sits right next, it sits on the water, water's edge. Uh, it's a wonderful example. And, you know, and the, the thing about Mumbai and what was interesting about the two presentations was one is the western edge, which is uh, not a deep harbor. Uh, it's an extended edge in that the water in the low tide recedes and you have a rockscape uh, and this is where they intervened with public spaces and, and on the eastern side it's a waterfront that's man-made that's been invested in over 200 years uh, and it has some really complex mechanics there. For example, it has a very sophisticated system of dry docks which were cutting edge technologies when they were built and these, are, these can almost become functional and productive because the entire topography of the city which is factitious in the sense it was man-made through reclamations that the topography in any case slopes to the docks for drainage, you could actually be collecting fresh water on the edge of, uh, of the sea, in a sense, uh, to even capture it as a resource, be, besides looking at ecologies and mangroves and you know, all the rest of it. So there's a lot of potential if one can actually use them from the perspective of production uh, and purpose and then begin to layer on the poetics. Mm. Uh, we are starting with the poetics exactly. in terms of, of the design agenda. Um, Ulash, I think there was a question in the back. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, actually, uh, I would like to highlight the roots of New York in a way that the um, city of Amsterdam, how the canals uh, being shaped, the, the quality and uh, the image of the city, but also the economy. And re referring to your uh, statement of things are not going easily after the Second World War when the uh, city plan the uh, city of Amsterdam has a, a strict plan on uh, shutting down all the canals, having a business district there. Uh, but slowly, slowly, with it, the, the mechanisms of studs have stalled. Like a big business setting up an NGO, having a strategic real estate uh, 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 operations, uh, the corner of the houses they bought uh, and rent to revitalize by the people, and how this uh, hardcore decision turned into a more uh, cultural led. Uh, um, Regeneration. So that might be an interesting uh, question for the future uh, for the Manhattan, like high density and canals. That was my comment. Yeah. Other. Uh, I just wanted to make the observation that I think something very unusual is happening in New York City with regards to the waterfront and the uses of the waterfront, and I'm talking about the recreational boaters' uses of the waterfront. This essentially, I think, is a grassroots push where no city planner would have ever envisioned it ever happening before. Uh, last season, over 14,000 people got into kayaks and canoes and paddled and rowed on the East River, the Hudson River, and our various waterways, and it's driving a vision for the planners now to incorporate that human use into their view of what Waterfront Park should be. Thank you. It's a, it, it's a really good point. And I would just say, to, to give the planners a little bit of credit, in part, I think, that evolution is a function of, of two things. One is cleaner waters, which has taken an army of people a long time to establish, and also the fact that some of those um, industrial waterfronts have been turned over to recreation, and so people are at the water's edge and just want to go further into it, which has been a great thing. There was a question over, over here. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have heard a lot of, uh, you know, uh, civic participation, uh, emphasis on culture, sustainability. I'm so glad to hear from Richard Plan emphasize about the sustainability, the future of the rising sea level. And so far, uh, it's very short-sighted. Uh, today, what happened in China is uh, the competition of each state, decentralization, everybody wants to have the highest tall building, over capacity, and it's, the tsunami is coming. Now, of course, you know, uh, a concentration of population is a communication primarily, where the number one is uh, the bloodstream, the economic, a place to live, and uh, 
the, the leisure, uh, you know, the games, and uh, in, when you have that uh, at a weekend, the hobby. But have we ever considered, I see urban is a living organism. Some is a larger, you know, the other one is a smaller. It all connected to each other. We learn from nature, the tree, the roots, the so tree. A, can you just tell us your question so we can Yeah, okay. I, I would like to know if uh, any uh, example of uh, urban planning that integrated with the regional planning at large, that they don't compete with each other. And any an example from Mumbai or India or, or Rio or in Let me just in make Turkey. sure I understand your question. Are you talking about localized planning that re responds exactly. to a bigger regional area it's, as opposed yes. to one place? Yes, yes. Any example that uh, we can present a little bit? Give me a hint. Um, well, I can, I can speak for New York only in the sense that we have tried to do that for a very long time. We've tried to do that through um, a civic institution called the Regional Plan Association, but more importantly, we tried to do it with the creation of a bi-state entity whose mandate was literally 25 miles around the Statue of Liberty and crossing two states. And I can say we've, we've had mixed results. It was very fruitful for a number of years, and it's probably past its sell-by date. But it's very hard to think about a region when there are political entities that are competing. And that's really, I hate to give you a political answer, but it becomes very, very difficult when those entities comprising the region pull in different directions. And my sense is that whether it's you know federal and state in India, or whether it's New York and New Jersey here, or whatever it is in other places, unless you have an externality, a kind of deus ex machina, like the Olympics, like the Olympics, I mean, London and Rio have done amazing things, you know, with water, with all kinds of things. But that kind of push, with, in the absence of that, you fall back into some, some more traditional confines and parameters. So I think we have time for one more question. If there is one, if not, I'm going to wrap this panel up. Just one quick thing about Shanghai, for example, is about the same size as New York City in the region. New York City has what? Three states? Four, right? I mean, three comprise the metropolitan area. Yeah, three states, very different governance. Uh, Shanghai is basically one unified, I mean, it has levels, but one unified piece uh, for 22, 23 million people. Uh, so in, in our case, there has been a lot, as you say, a lot of attempts to deal with this kind of diversity, but it is difficult at the regional scale. That's why I think in the end we don't have a decent connection to the airport. <laughs> yeah, the Port Authority was discussed this morning, but there's no other lo ro logical explanation for that, you know. I mean, uh, but anyway, right. that's. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions? If not, I think I'll thank this panel and ask Vishan to come up and close the day out. So Kate gave me the en enviable job of wrapping up the day and summarizing the day, uh, and I stand between you and your weekends. Um, and so I'm not truly going to try to wrap up thousands and thousands of kilometers of waterfront for tens and tens of millions of people across thousands of miles of territory, uh, and instead uh, just actually make a little comment on format in my way of thanking everyone. First, thanking uh, everyone who traveled from abroad uh, to put all the extraordinary time and energy and effort into being here today, uh, uh, e even as far away as Boston. Um, and um, <laughs> Sorry, Raul, I had to do that, where, 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 wherever you went. Um, uh, I also just, you know, Kate and the Durst organization have created this extraordinary partnership in putting on this conference every year. And it started, I think, with mega projects, which was largely a New York-based thing. And then last year was New York and London, and she brought together all this sort of comparative analysis of what's happening in London in infrastructure versus New York and so forth. And this year, of course, this very ambitious project of bringing in people from all four cities. Next year, I'm pretty sure she's going to tell me that it's a solar system conference that ambassador <laughs> that she's teaming with Richard Branson, and people are actually coming from Jupiter and Venus. Um, and then we truly will be the Galactic School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, GSAP. Um, 
but uh, but uh, the, the, I think the format is extraordinary. I think the format is extremely important for what our Studio X directors are doing on the ground in each of these cities because I think uh, these conversations will clearly continue uh, as all of these wonderful professionals go back to their home territory and the debates will go on. And the debates, to me, are what is the fundamentally important thing. It's very interesting to me that uh, the cities we talked about today were all, uh, are all democracies and that so many of the debates about whether, you know, what happens with the development versus what happens in terms of democratic space in a city uh, a play out uh, on our stage but play out in all of the various stages on this thin little territory that we call the waterfront, uh, which is really not the edge of something but the center of something. Uh, and so uh, whether it's sea level rise or all of these jurisdictions or all of these very uh, strong kind of things that we need to debate and think about uh, when it comes to our waterfront, it's very clear that uh, none of us would live in a landlocked city. Um, so with that, uh, I just want to thank Kate very much for all of her time and energy and Daniel and all the other people who work with you uh, and thank everyone for attending today. Enjoy your weekend.